contemporary advances in electron microscopy. And indeed, some of the things I'll tell you depend either from the past or for the future on exactly the sorts of uh, techniques and advances that Ohad has been telling you about. But what I'll try to do in the next hour or so um, is to illustrate the connection between structure and mechanism that single molecule methods, both in vitro and in cells, have allowed us to approach, in some ways following up on Michael's suggestion that sooner or later we can avoid worrying about entropy. The nice thing about single molecule approaches is that they finally realize what all structural biologists have been thinking about for a long time. Uh, we think of individual structures. We talk about the structure, or since most of us realize that the structures we're interested have a large range of dynamic properties, we talk about structural dynamics. But we're really thinking about a molecule, not 10 to the 23rd of them. And uh, therefore, the kinds of approaches that you started to see in Tom Kirschhausen's talk yesterday uh, have liberated, as if you wish, from uh, the curse of the Boltzmann distribution or uh, from the curse of the ensemble average of a Boltzmann distribution and allowed us to see the individual elements of the distribution itself. Now, I'll be talking about viruses and viral entry. Viruses, as you surely know, are carriers of genetic information. They carry it from cell to cell. And if you don't think of them as an infectious agent, but rather as an element of the fundamental properties of a terrestrial living system that involves transfer of information through nucleic acids, then viruses are simply extracellular organelles that manage to get <coughs> nucleic acid-borne information from one cell to another. The infectious viral particles, the molecular machine that does all sorts of things, as I show here. And in particular, what we'll be interested in for the next 50 minutes is uh, the introduction of the genetic information into um, a new cell. Now, let me see. Is this a pointer? And if so, is there a pointer button? It's in the middle, I'm told, this thing. Oh, but I'm probably holding it the wrong way. Uh, no. Uh, oh, well. Is there an on off switch on this uh, gizmo? Oh. Uh, well. I owe lots of other aspects of my life to Tom so that uh, he can now. Uh, <laughs> 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 All right, anyhow. The principal structural distinction we'll be talking about is a distinction between uh, what are called enveloped viruses. Here we go. All right. Use, use Tommy's. Tom all right, all right. This one is also worth an embarras de richesse after. Uh, I am. Yeah, yeah. After, uh, after all, I won't survive if I use another one. Anyhow, uh, I, the principal structural distinction is be between envelope viruses, those that have a membrane of their own, bud out through a membrane of one cell, either at the cell surface or into an intracellular compartment like the Golgi or ER and then ultimately escape through some secretory route, or viruses that do, and then enter the new cell by fusion of the viral membrane with some membrane of the new cell, or non-envelope viruses that have to, um, in general, have to lyse the cell they uh, grow in or, or find other means of getting out, and uh, that uh, must, in some sense, perforate a, uh, a membrane 
of the cell they enter. And I'll talk a little bit about both of these <coughs> mechanisms, membrane fusion and membrane perforation, illustrated here by influenza virus, um, studied with a fusion protein that we'll talk about, the flu hemagglutinin, and rotavirus here in a cryo EM uh, projection, uh, which is a non-envelope virus, and we'll talk about its mem mechanism of membrane perforation. You heard um, some of the introductory <coughs> aspects of that from uh, Tom's talk yesterday. Let's begin with fusion. We know a lot more about mechanisms of fusion. Lipid bilayer fusion proceeds through an intermediate known as a hemifusion structure of some kind that involves um, merger of the um, opposed leaflets of the two um, lipid bilayers that are fusing uh, without yet merger of the distal leaflets. Uh, this sort of stalk-like structure is almost certainly the productive uh, pathway. There is a pathway through a kind of open diaphragm like this uh, it, uh, in which the uh, distal leaflets still remain intact. Uh, that is, I think, for most uh, of the biological hemifusion systems, we'll talk about uh, a, a, a dead end. Uh, there's plenty of experimental evidence in addition to uh, original model building evidence for such uh, a, a mechanism. And recently work from Axel Brunger and Eva Nogales has, has shown uh, quite clearly that when you get these large hemifusion structures, uh, these large hemifusion diaphragms, uh, that you've got a dead end, at least in the case of fusion by snaps and snares. Um, in any case, the, the, um, the uh, mechanism here is one that is thermodynamically, or the reaction here that gives you one bilayer from two, is uh, it's sort of a grotesque condensation reaction that involves not uh, making or breaking of chemical bonds, but rather uh, uh, breaking and then making of, 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 of lipid bilayers, uh, is one that's thermodynamically downhill, but with substantial kinetic barrier, and so a catalyst requ is required, and that's what viral fusion proteins are about. <coughs> and so the first part of the talk will be about, if you wish, the mechanistic enzymology of how these catalysts um, actually work, and I'll talk rather quickly and summarily, both about work on influenza virus and some work on the so-called flaviviruses of which West Nile and dengue are well-known uh, uh, examples. And what I'll be um, showing you to illustrate in part the point I made, the connection between structure and mechanism we can make with single molecule, or in this case single particle, single virus particle fluorescence measurements uh, we can connect structure and mechanism in a particularly powerful way. So let me remind you a little bit about uh, influenza virus. Uh, it is uh, about a thousand angstroms in diameter. It's not like the viruses that you heard from uh, Bill Gelbart yesterday, a, uh, a, a very regular symmetrical structure, uh, but rather a, a, a somewhat the biologist's word is pleomorphic, a sort of multi, multi-shaped structure. But the, the 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 major species that you get out of influenza when um, you cough, uh, as it grows in our lungs, is an elongated particle that can sometimes be quite quite filamentous. But at any rate, has a minimum length uh, determined by the uh, length of the. Uh, of, of the genomic segments that there are eight of them, eight distinct genomic segments incorporated into the particle that run roughly parallel to each other from the uh, point of initiation of a budding out. And the two proteins on the surface, the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase, are actually somewhat segregated in the freshly budded particles um, with the hemagglutinin studying, mo studying most of the, uh, of the uh, surface and the neuraminidase uh, re relatively segregated toward the last end to emerge as the particle buds out. This is work of Peter Rosenthal, um, who, uh, whose uh, uh, cryotomogram of the, uh, or a section through his cryotomogram uh, of, of uh, these filamentous uh, 
flu particles out or elongated flu particles I, I show here. The hemagglutinin is the protein we're be, we'll be talking about. It's the protein that's the major antigen on the surface of flu. It's the H of H1N1, H5, and so on. Um, and uh, it is also both the receptor binding protein and the, uh, and, and the fusion catalyst. The classic structural work, of course, was done by my late colleague Don Wiley in collaboration with John Scahill at, at Mill Hill, uh, who continues to work on this. And it's a classic structure that we've been able recently to come back to to explore some of the mechanisms I'll talk about. It's synthesized as a single chain precursor known as HA0 that is cleaved by proteases either in late compartments as the protein arrives at the cell surface where the virus buds out or probably more generally by extracellular proteases secreted by other cells in the bronchial and uh, alveolar uh, uh, epithelia. In any case, that cleavage, critical to activate it as a catalyst, think of this as the proenzyme, and this is the activated enzyme. Then uh, the cleavage, just like chymotrypsin needs to be activated by a cleavage or trypsin, uh, the cleavage in this case uh, uh, either excises one amino acid or just breaks a peptide bond, depending upon the details of the sequence, uh, just here in a loop. And there is a very minor but critical rearrangement of the fusion peptide, actually not all that different from the critical rearrangement of the new N-terminus of trypsin or chymotrypsin when they're cleaved from the proenzyme, uh, that tucks in uh, here on the particle threefold axis. These are, or, or the mo molecular threefold axis. These are trimers, as will be evident from the, from the, um, the, the pictures here. The receptor binding site is here at the top of the molecule. The receptor is sialic acid uh, on any glycan, and um, most commonly, I think, for productive infection is probably on um, glycolipids. And then down here, not shown here because this crystal structure was determined from a uh, uh, purified ecto domain of the protein. Just down here would be the transmembrane segments, just a few residues farther along from the C-terminus here uh, that go through the viral membrane. And there is a very short cytoplasmic or internal uh, segment at the C-terminus of the whole molecule. Now, uh, this is the form that folds in the ER, and it's the free, free energy minimum, the global free energy minimum of this single chain. The cleavage, of course, creates a new situation in which the global free energy minimum need not be the same, and indeed it is not, because all of a sudden the constraint that this, this residue and the next residue on either side of the cleavage have to be exactly 3.8 angstroms from alpha carbon to alpha carbon has gone, and the free energy minimum uh, uh, is, is now different. Nonetheless, this is a, uh, an extremely stable state, very high kinetic barrier to moving forward to the real free energy minimum unless it's protonated. And so exposure to low pH triggers a uh, quite substantial, indeed a, a quite surprising when it was first seen, conformational rearrangement in which uh, the HA1 part, the N-terminal half that contains the receptor binding site, uh, dissociates from the top here. There's actually a tether down here, a disulfide bond, so it doesn't fully dissociate, but gets out of the way, so to speak. And the HA2, the red part, turns itself inside out, quite literally. That is, the part that was on the inside is now on the outside, and vice versa. And most important, it turns itself into a hairpin such that the N-terminus here, which is called the fusion peptide, and I'll explain why in a second, and the C-terminus here, the transmembrane segment, wind up next to each other. As a result, the two membranes involved in the fusion, because this fusion peptide inserts into the target membrane, I'll show you that in a minute, uh, and the transmembrane segment anchored in the viral membrane, wind up next to each other. 
And that's really the critical feature of this rearrangement, that a hydrophobic element, and indeed it is, and another hydrophobic element, the w one inserted into one of the membranes and the other inserted in the other, that those two elements wind up next door to each other. And so as a result from those two structures, and they are two crystal structures, one has to infer what's going on in between. And it's this sort of picture that, if you wish, by inferential interpolation, as well as by some indirect biochemical results, arose from having seen, if you wish, what I've diagrammed here as state one, and what I've diagrammed here as the final state, this hairpin-like state, uh, leave it, leaving off um, from anything in the later part of the diagram, just to avoid confusion, the red representation of the HA1 part, which, as I said, uh, separates from the top. And uh, that one does know from direct experiments, if you disulfide tether them, as Don Wiley's lab showed, uh, a bit after the first structure emerged, um, indeed after the two structures emerged, it showed that uh, indeed separation of the top parts was essential to move on to fusion. So um, as I said, uh, what we'd like to do is do mechanistic enzymology on this sort of uh, pseudoenzyme, if you wish. Maybe it is an enzyme if an enzyme is any protein catalyst. Um, and uh, try to understand, what, uh, try to fill in, if you wish, the picture of those intermediate steps, or at least confirm aspects of what I've um, diagrammed there as a, a logical sequence of events from one structure to another. And so in particular, I'd like to, to, to show you how we can understand a bit about the characteristics of the extended intermediate that is postulated, so to speak, whoops, um, there is an extended intermediate that's a critical part of this reaction. I guess I should have pointed that out in addition to this hemifusion intermediate. An extended intermediate in which the fusion peptide, having emerged from its pocket, the end terminus of HA2, um, uh, inserts into the target membrane, joining the two membranes, so this hairpinization, to uh, make up a ghastly English neologism, uh, uh, of the structure, this collapse of the structure, uh, 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 to bring the two uh, membrane-inserted elements together, drags the two membranes together, and overcomes that critical kinetic barrier, which is, uh, or one of the critical kinetic barriers, which is the so-called hydration force between two lipid bilayers uh, that uh, uh, makes uh, approach closer than about 10 or 15 angstroms uh, uh, unfavorable, and one needs to input free energy into overcoming that barrier. The, and I'll show you this presently, that one needs to input, if you wish, the free energy of collapse of several of these, it turns out, in order to overcome the hydration force that, um, that prevents the two membranes from coming together. Any of you who've made liposomes know that they don't fuse spontaneously very, very uh, readily if they're just in suspension, uh, even though uh, there's a lot of free energy gained in taking two smaller spheres and fusing it into a single sphere. So to get to that extended intermediate, you can imagine a bunch of steps. I don't want to go into this. This is more detailed than I want to drag you into today. But one can imagine a series of molecular steps that have to include, of course, expulsion of the fusion peptide from that pocket and formation of a, an elongated helix. Indeed, Peter Kim's laboratory showed even before this structure that this loop-like element in the, um, in, in, in the precursor structure uh, actually has a very strong tendency to form a, three, a trimeric coiled coil. And so part of the recovery of free energy is the formation of coiled coil from that loop. And um, several other local rearrangements are necessary in order to generate 
the extended intermediate, which then has to break here and fold back in order to uh, arrive at that final hairpin structure. So um, the experimental configuration um, that we've um, used for this, uh, originally developed by a, a graduate student named Dan Floyd, who worked jointly with Antoine van Ooyen, and, and then uh, more recently, both improved and, 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 and extended by Tiana Ivanovich, whose work I'll talk about. Uh, she's now just starting as a faculty member at Brandeis University, uh, is uh, an adaptation for a single viral con um, format of um, a classic fusion assay in which you put a fluorescent dye in one membrane uh, at a concentration at which it largely quenches. And uh, when the two membranes merge, that dye uh, diffuses even hemi at the hemifusion point, diffuses into the target <coughs> bilayer. And in some experiments, uh, although not all of the ones we've done, you can also get a soluble dye into the particle and record the point at which a full aqueous channel opens up, the final fusion pore development at the end of the, uh, of the fusion reaction. And indeed, hemifusion always precedes um, fusion pore formation, uh, that is dequenching of the green dye in this diagram always um, precedes um, a loss of, of the red dye. And uh, several other elements are a pH sensor, fluorescein in fact, uh, to show when the pH is dropped. This is all done in a little flow cell in a total internal <coughs> reflection microscope. And um, uh, a <coughs> bit of glycolipid, a bit of gangliocide doped into the membrane to act as a receptor. And so one gets, uh, flows in a, a suspension of virus particles. Some of them bind to the receptor uh, in the membrane. One can then lower the pH. The background fluorescein bleaches uh, at the point at which the low pH flows into the cell. Uh, at room temperature, here is the time scale. In other words, everything <coughs> happens over the course of about a minute or so. In this particular trace, a quote typical one, <laughs> namely one of the prettiest we ever got, um, uh, the uh, hemifusion occurred here and pore formation occurred here. There are various, um, uh, there's a whole distribution, of course, uh, and uh, there's what the hemifusion step looks like sped up by, I think, about tenfold. Um, and so one can get histograms of times to hemifusion from the pH drop point, um, times to pore formation, and of course also times from hemifusion to pore formation, something you could not get from an ensemble measurement uh, because one's tracking this for individual particles. So you know for a given fusion time point when that particle uh, underwent hemifusion. There's one other step that I don't want to elaborate on because it's a useful experimental artifact, but for the computational biologists, I need to mention it because I'm about to talk about a simulation of these kinetics, and I, there is an, a parameter that is constrained by this additional observation. Uh, once the, the particles have attached, as the solution <coughs> continues to flow, a number of them actually um, continue attached to the membrane if they fell off the membrane or were released from the membrane, they'd, they'd uh, diffuse out of the, right away diffuse out of the evanescent field of the Turk microscope. Um, and then um, uh, ultimately, uh, maybe in this case 10 seconds later, um, are stationary, although this one didn't hemifuse for about another uh, 70 seconds. Uh, that bit of arrest, we called it, is uh, due to the same conformational change that leads ultimately to fusion, as Tiana could show by um, finding, and I won't go into the details, that the rate limiting step for both, at least under the conditions we're doing it, is expulsion of the fusion peptide from that pocket because of a network of hydrogen bonds here that constrain it and because of inference from uh, mutations that <coughs> included one that happened to have shown up in one lab strain of um, flu uh, of a otherwise utterly conserved glycine to a serine and 
it's part of that network. In any case, as a result of experiments that show that arrest and, which as I say is after all there's no flow cell in our endosomes where that fusion event occurs, the reason that low pH, that, that the molecule has evolved to use low pH as a trigger is of course that fusion occurs in an endosome uh, after uh, uh, the virus is taken up into a cell by the endocytic process that Tom talked about yesterday. And as a result, um, if you wish, the drop in pH in an endosome is a signal to the virus that it's in the compartment from which uh, it has evolved to fuse. And uh, so at any rate, the proposed mechanism of all this is a stochastic pH-dependent firing, I'll call it for today, just to use an imagistic uh, verb, namely um, uh, progression through that uh, quite striking conformational rearrangement. Formation of an extended intermediate in the contact zone of any fired HA, in the contact zone between uh, virus and target membrane. Now I showed you that hemagglutinin is densely studded in the outer membrane, and so there'll be an extended contact zone. It's somewhere between about a 50 and 100 hemagglutinin trimers in our estimate, both from the kinetics and even from looking at um, micrographs of virus attached, that is the target membrane deforms slightly in the contact zone to begin to wrap around uh, the virus particle. Uh, at any rate, the extended intermediate then engages the target membrane and anchors the particle. And then rapid cooperative progression to hemifusion can occur only when a critical number, and we're going to get that number, of adjacent trimers have engaged the target <coughs> membrane. So that's the proposed mechanism. And I'll illustrate it here and then suggest how we simulated it. That is in a simple kinetic simulation, simple MATLAB stepwise kinetic simulation. And so here might be a target zone. This is a kind of uh, s illustrative um, representation that Tiana actually got her dad to do. He was a, uh, an architectural artist. And um, uh, over time, stochastically, um, at, with a probability that depends, of course, on the pH, on the final pH, uh, uh, something we can vary experimentally and use as an additional parameter in all this, then uh, flu uh, hemagglutinins, the trimers, uh, undergo the conformational change, expose their fusion peptide, and that can engage the target membrane. And it turns out when three or four of these have done so, then uh, one, uh, the, the particle arrests, uh, as observed for those particles that were drifting. But we have to assume the same probability of firing for any hemagglutinin here, and that's why this time point gives us an additional constraint on the kinetics that makes this reduces the number of free parameters in the uh, simulation quite significantly. Uh, and uh, then the assumption is when some number, and one gets that out of the simulation, of adjacent hemagglutinins have um, uh, have engaged, then they can collapse readily and generate hemifusion and subsequently fusion. The notion is this. this uh, the stable final structure for this hemagglutinin, for example, is the collapsed structure. And this is an, um, a, an intermediate constrained by the fact that the two membranes resist deformation. And there is a question. How many of these are needed to work together uh, simply because they're linked by the two membranes in order to overcome the, uh, the, the uh, kinetic barrier to bringing the two <coughs> membranes together. And so we've simulated that, or Tiana worked out a simulation for it, involving assuming just a local hexagonal lattice of um, uh, hemagglutinins. This illustration was for a contact patch of about 120 of them. Somewhat smaller contact patch turns out to be the better number for many of the um, data points that, that she's collected. And then you just stepwise through um, a simple simulation uh, program in which with some probability for any step, uh, an arbitrary you know, delta t, 
um, there is some probability of any given hemagglutinin, quite independent of the others, of firing off and attaching to the membrane. When some number have um, engaged, you should meet the uh, uh, time point to arrest. When some other number of when some number of adjacent ones turns out that the critical number is three, uh, but one can model it for any number uh, with different possible patterns for an effective cluster, and um, three for the virus we were working with initially, the um, H3 subtype looks like for at least one H1 subtype, the recent pandemic subtype, um, the number is a bit higher, uh, probably four or five. Uh, but uh, uh, then, the, um, th then, then, then one proceeds to hemifusion, and one can fit the histograms one gets, both for this step and that step. Uh, and as I said, the, the answer is actually quite clear and free of lots of, 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 of an un any unhappy number of adjustable parameters. This is a result of mutations that one can do at that fusion peptide site. One also has other control over varying this in order to uh, gain confidence in the simulation. So uh, does three make sense? Yes. Obviously, if the free energy recovered on this collapse were greater than the free energy of insertion of the fusion peptides into the target membrane, you'd yank them out instead of distorting the membrane. And in fact, we know that the free energy of insertion of a single peptide from measurements that have been done by Tam and others um, uh, is about eight kilocalories per mole. Three of these would therefore give you about 25 kilocalories per mole. So you mustn't gain more than that on pulling this down because otherwise you'd just destroy what you have. Indeed, the um, uh, the estimate for that kinetic barrier from all sorts of um, uh, estimates is somewhere, but well, that is from all sorts, from all sorts of um, theoretical calculations based on sort of classical deformation potentials, but um, uh, is anywhere from 50 to 100 kilocalories per mole, so that three is a very reasonable number. You might gain 20 kilocalories per mole from one of these. You're going to need about three of them in order to get over that kind of barrier. So this mechanism then, and um, again, I want to outline its, its characteristics, is a completely stochastic firing of the HA trimers in the contact zone, or that is anywhere on the virus particle. Indeed, if you acidify the virus particle, all of the trimers wind up, if you wish, upside down um, uh, uh, in s with their fusion peptides folded back as hairpins and their fusion peptides inserted into the viral membrane itself. So there's a stochastic firing of the HA trimers, but if the um, uh, fusion peptides engage the target membrane, then they can't, it, th that, that trimer can't instantly collapse back down to an upside down structure. And so there's a rapid progression to hemifusion and hence resolution of things only when a critical number of adjacent trimers have engaged the target membrane. Call it a tug of war model merely because if you have a tug of war and uh, let's imagine there isn't a team there but just a constant force, uh, the instant you add some critical number of members of the team, the rope will, will pull and you don't need to talk to each other, you don't need to touch each other, you don't need to cooperate in any way except all pulling on the same resistance. And so there isn't any need for some structure around the neck, some defined cooperative interaction among adjacent trimers, you just need a, a cooperativity imparted by the fact that they are um, engaged in target membrane. And one further consequence of all this is that there's a relatively long-lived extended intermediate. Some of you familiar with HIV will know that there are fusion inhibitors or a one uh, clinically somewhat relevant and used fusion inhibitor, it's a peptide, so it's not a very good drug, um, uh, but used in certain circumstances, or has been, I don't think it's used much any longer, that um, is a fusion inhibitor and targets the extended intermediate in that case, which is uh, an analogous extended uh, structure. One further feature of all this that very recently Tiana has been able to obtain by 
fitting some data on the number of FAB fragments of, an, of a fusion inhibitory antibody, uh, data from Antoine's laboratory, Antoine van Oichen's laboratory, um, uh, done by a student but not, not um, part of our initial collaboration, um, is that actually a fair number of the events are abortive. That is, that the fusion peptides fail to engage and the, um, and the molecule actually does wind up in the upside down configuration. Um, and you can get that out of, um, quite nicely, out of the sorts of numbers uh, in which the FABs are fluorescently labeled so you know how many FABs are needed to uh, prevent fusion of a given particle and so on. But I won't go into that today. What I do want to do is say that um, the same kind of mechanism is true of a protein that looks very different, namely the one on flaviviruses on dengue and West Nile virus. These are virus particles that are quite different. They're actually icosahedrally symmetric. They have 180 protein subunits clustered as dimers and packed in this sort of herringbone arrangement with the icosahedral symmetry you heard about yesterday. Uh, and the molecule, I don't think I'll go into the details of it, but it doesn't look anything like flu hemagglutinin. It's packed as a dimer on the surface, although as you'll see, it needs to trimerize in order to catalyze fusion. Fusion is here also low pH trigger because it um, fuses from endosomes. And in this case, the fusion element is not an N-terminal cleavage product, but rather a hydrophobic loop hidden in this prefusion state uh, at a protein-protein interface in the dimer. This is the structure of the ectodomain, which has a central organizing domain, red, two loops that form a secondary domain here, yellow, uh, and a C-terminal domain uh, that's an IG fold, and then a segment that isn't part of the crystal structure of about 50 residues that connects it to the transmembrane anchor. The seg that segment and the transmembrane anchor can be seen in a quite beautiful uh, electron cryomicroscopy reconstruction from Hangzhou and colleagues uh, fairly recently. Here's the reference, uh, which shows us that that stem folds into a sort of helical hairpin in the surface of the lipid bilayer membrane. Uh, and these are amphipathic helices, if you wish, and then forms this helical hairpin that is the transmembrane anchor. It's a hairpin because uh, it has to come back out since this is made from a polyprotein and the next protein down the line is also a secreted, in that case, protein and so needs a signal sequence. But that's a fine point. In any case, what <coughs> does low pH do? Uh, low pH triggers uh, dissociation of this dimer and therefore exposure of the fusion loop uh, and formation of a trimer in which ultimately the folding back of the of this C terminal domain and the um, and, and the reconfiguration of this stem bit uh, leads to a structure again in which the transmembrane segments and the fusion loops, the fusion elements uh, are next to each other. Uh, so again, given those two structures, one can um, interpolate between them from here to here in a similar way. Uh, dissociation of the dimer, trimerization. There are various in vitro experiments that I haven't time to go into that justify thinking of it this way. And indeed, in the simulation, I'll just allude to quite quickly, um, uh, constrain the kinetic parameters. Uh, formation of a trimer that um, uh, requires or at least is facilitated by uh, insertion of the fusion loops into the target membrane and then collapse to the structure I've shown you. So the, again, an extended intermediate that in two steps collapses to lead to hemifusion and ultimately to a fusion pore. Same experiment can be done that I showed you. In this case, one needs to use uh, a nickel NTA lipid with a receptor ectodomain 
his tagged uh, doped into the membrane, but it's the same idea. Uh, and so uh, Luc Chow has carried out exactly the same sort of experiment I showed you, collected a lot of data that I I'm not going to show you, otherwise you'd see a slide full of histograms you don't want to look at, uh, and carried out a simulation that, again, because of time, I'm not going to go into. It's a little more complicated because there's an extra step here, namely a reversible dissociation of the dimer and a clustering and irreversible formation of a trimer. But I can assure you that because of in vitro experiments, we can constrain the extra parameters so that this isn't trying to fit something with more parameters than is kosher. Uh, and, um, I, and so in this case, one gets um, a, um, a, a mechanism that involves about two um, trimers necessary for, um, for fusion. And the <coughs> point I want to make is, again, that um, there's a finite lifetime because the members' individual <coughs> collapse uh, resists, the two membranes resist collapse, uh, and you need to wait for more than one adjacent event. And it turns out that probably two, event, two <coughs> adjacent events are, are enough. Uh, and so we can compare both the West Nile and the flu reactions. And in fact, it's essentially the same mechanism. And I like to think of this as uh, sort of Trypsin and subtilisin, if you wish, exactly the same mechanism, but trypsin and subtilisin have nothing in common other than uh, a serine, uh, a histidine, and an aspartic acid arrayed in the, and I guess an oxyanion hull, arrayed in the classic charge relay uh, manner, but otherwise are completely, architecturally completely different proteins. Nonetheless, the enzym enzymatic mechanism, the electron pushing, is the same. And likewise here, the enzymatic mechanism is the same, or the catalytic mechanism is the same, even though the architecture of the two proteins is completely different. And indeed, even for, from Axel Brunger's work uh, with Steve Chu and others on snare-mediated fusion, the mechanism there seems to be uh, essentially the same as well. But there's one important additional feature. I've emphasized that in the case of, um, of the viral fusion, the delay is due to the fact you've got to wait until some critical number, two or three or probably four or five in the case of some flu strains, uh, because they just aren't recovering quite as much free energy from the same collapse. Uh, I, that critical number of, um, of, of extended intermediates has collected next to each other. But in the case of the snares where calcium triggering um, releases, leads to fusion of synaptic vesicles within milliseconds, an additional feature is evolved, namely that the calcium signal is received by a complex of synaptotagmin and complexin in the case of the particular neuronal snares that Brunger and colleagues have studied, so that the um, fusion intermediate, or not the intermediate, it's just before hemifusion, uh, but an intermediate state, a partly zipped up state, is trapped by synaptotagmin and complexin, such that raising the calcium concentration, which is the trigger there from, um, from a calcium leak in the, in, due to the action potential, um, <coughs> Uh, that calcium trigger can simultaneously trigger everybody. And since they're all collected, the relative critical number or more are there, then this event proceeds very fast. But otherwise, uh, at least in principle, there's no need to have any further coordination other than the fact that they all feel calcium at identical times. And of course, the diffusion of calcium over this kind of uh, distance is faster than a millisecond. Now, there are a bunch of questions about this kind of fusion mechanism that I haven't yet raised even, let alone talked about. And some of them are ones we can't yet answer. Uh, but uh, we've got current roots to the answer. And one of them I'll just mention is, uh, is there any um, role of per per perturbing 
the target bilayer by insertion of these uh, fusion peptides or fusion loops. And we don't know the answer to that yet because we can't, we don't know enough about the final structure in this membrane embedded region, but I hope we're about to. Um, my guess is that that's a second order effect, but that guess could be dead wrong uh, because there's so many different kinds of fusion peptides and fusion loops. There are various other structures we know about from vesicular stomatitis virus and, and hepatitis virus and, and so on. Um, herpes virus, rather, and so on, that um, um, uh, suggest to me, at any rate, there isn't any major role for you know membrane curving aspects of all this. But maybe I'm wrong. In any case, um, what's certainly true is that it, it, it anchors the the protein in the other membrane, so that when this conformational changes change occurs, the two membranes are distorted. Um, uh, to bring them to overcome the hydration force barrier, but in any case, um, what I said is that, of course, in the crystal structure I showed you very quickly, the part of the stem and the final transmembrane part was missing because that was made from a soluble fragment. But Luke Chow has now figured out how to make the post-fusion structure of the intact post-fusion form of the intact um, uh, West Nile virus um, uh, glycoprotein studied it with um, one copy each subunit of an FAB, and this is a very early stage. We've actually already done better. Uh, 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 gotten um, Crow-EM images that I think will ultimately lead us to a structure down here, and then a an ability to go back to the experimental arrangement I showed you because we'll know what residues to mutate or, or what questions to ask at any rate about formation of the final structure here and ask questions about the lipid bilayer and about um, the, um, the, the, the fusion step, the hemifusion to fusion pore step as well. In any case, I'm going to conclude with just two or three minutes, because I can do so quickly. You saw many of the details yesterday about um, non-envelope viral entry and the mechanism of perforation uh, of the membranes by the entry proteins of double-strand RNA viruses. Um, those are rather complicated non-enveloped viruses in um, uh, much more complicated than calpichlorotic model that you heard about yesterday. Um, they're multi-layered protein structures, but they have one huge advantage, and that is that there is a particular protein that's responsible for the perforation step, and we can study it and do things with it um, so, as I said, they're sort of uh, an inner particle and an outer layer with the yellow protein and the red protein uh, forming that outer layer. Um, the role of that outer layer is to get this inner particle into, as you saw yesterday, into the cytosol. Uh, it has a polymerase inside and it can make, uh, and, make and cap has a camping enzyme inside as well, or one for each of the 11 RNA segments, uh, and can make um, messenger RNA. Think of this as, an, as it never disassembles. Think of this as a, um, an honorary nucleus for an RNA, double-strand RNA virus that replicates entirely in the cytosol. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the capped message is extruded from uh, the particle uh, synthesized from double-strand RNA segments as if they were double-strand DNA segments. That is, the, the transcription is conservative and, and uh, unlike single-strand RNA viruses where the, tra the, the formation of a new positive strand um, uh, displaces the, the previous one. There's a transcription bubble here, if you wish. In any case, that's not what we're talking about right now. Um, uh, it's that red protein that does the job and um, we know a lot of this because of um, cryo-electron microscopy, and in particular with the sorts of advances you just heard um, of, of maps that now extend beyond uh, three angstroms. Uh, here's a bit of one such map. Um, and the reason you could do this with large symmetrical particles like this, 
well before we could do it for non-symmetrical particles. These sorts of maps are now available from non-symmetrical structures that are um, substantially smaller than this. Indeed, we've got a map almost as good as this <coughs> from the polymerase of this, um, actually not of this virus, from a related polymerase from vesicular stomatitis virus um, at 3.1 angstroms that looks almost as good, not as good, as this 2.6 angstrom structure from or map from uh, uh, the single particle analysis. But that's um, more just a pendant to the previous talk. Uh, what I now want to talk, tell you about very quickly is what goes on with this red protein. So uh, here's what it looks like. It's a trimer of a single protein, but uh, you'll notice that it's got an odd asymmetric shape, and it's held in place by the yellow protein. It's called VP7. This protein gets cleaved from something called VP4 to VP8 and VP5. Don't worry about these horrible names. Uh, and uh, as a result of that cleavage, uh, it is activated to do its job. So start to think about fusion again, although this isn't fusion. The receptor binding site for sialic acid, is, uh, which is on glycolipids again, is up here at the top of the molecule. And the trimer is funny because this bit is a perfectly kosher trimer, nice threefold symmetric trimer, but the projecting parts, this is both the C-terminus and the N-terminus, and the projecting intermediate bits actually cluster asymmetrically so that two of them make what looks like a lovely dimer, that is a twofold symmetric structure here, but it's supported in kind of cantilever asymmetric sense by the corresponding element of the third subunit. And so you can perhaps see that here, where this domain is actually the same as these domains. And so this is the trimer, begins down here with purple and winds up in red. I won't go into the details, except to say that there's another state of it that corresponds, as we can tell from various experiments, to a stable final state after the cleavage between the purple part and the red part that is, if you wish, uh, an inverted trimeric structure in which the following has happened. There are hydrophobic loops here. They wind up facing the other way with respect to a segment here that becomes a three-stranded coiled coil. And so we already from those, from that comparison, postulated, and I'll show you now, well, you saw yesterday, and I may not have time to show you, uh, but you've saw, seen it already, data that suggests that this inversion step, this, this reconfiguration, um, is what is coupled to popping the membrane. And you saw yesterday that the trick is that you can strip off this outer layer and put recombinant protein back on. For any of you who've done virology or thought about virology, you'll realize that's wonderfully powerful because you can't make an entry incompetent mutant of a virus by directed mutagenesis unless you're so prescient that you can figure out how to make a conditional mutant, and most of us are not that good. But what you can do, if you can strip things off and put recombinant protein back on, is put on any protein you wish and trap the, the, the virus at a stage that prevents infection so you could never, even with reverse genetic methods, produce adequate quantities of that dead virus, as I, unless, as I said, you were so good that you could invent uh, a site-directed, temperature-sensitive mutant, um, and hence actually study this process. And as you saw yesterday, there's a further trick. You can label this with one color and label one or both of the outer proteins with different colors and watch what's going on and track cell entry. And so I'll just show you one such movie of the previous kind we could get. You saw the kind of modern Cadillac version. This is a Volkswagen version with a spinning disc microscope that gave us the sorts of information here. With, again, uh, there's a release step with the two particles and showed us that the time scale is about 10 minutes in which the virus binds. For a little while, it is releasable from the cell surface. Um, the, that trimeric anchor yellow protein, <coughs> oops, I'm out of time, so I'm going to really go fast, um, uh, takes three or four minutes to do its thing, at which point, um, uh, well, I shouldn't say that, but that, that protein is calcium stabilized. 
And so loss of calcium, as Tom suggested yesterday, uh, is an important trigger for something. After four or five minutes, the particle is no longer releasable, so it's been engulfed in some way. I'll show you what we think that is. And uh, in a few minutes later, then the, the release step occurs. And um, conventional electron microscopy and now um, uh, some initial uh, tomography with help from Daniela Nicastro suggests that it's this sort of business that's going on. It's the sort of thing that you saw in the simulation yesterday. But it is this perforation step that we're trying to get at and haven't quite gotten at yet. But here's our slightly fancier cartoon based on the proposal I showed you before, namely that the virus binds sialic acid, engulfs itself, and the, in those micrographs there was no evidence of a coat of any kind, and indeed this is clathrin independent, um, and that probably um, engagement of the target membrane by those fusion loops <coughs> All you need was sort of a breathing of VP8 away from the cluster. It's tethered down here, so it doesn't, it won't dissociate. Um, uh, to allow these elements to engage the target membrane, and then if, as we'd like to follow up and 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 demonstrate, this creates some kind of calcium leak, and you don't need much, then the anchor protein, the yellow protein, will dissociate. We know that to be true, um, and uh, release this protein to, to, to finish off the process, and that there must be something about that inversion step that stretches or otherwise uh, ruptures the target <coughs> membrane. And it is that that we're trying to get a better molecular handle on and can't at the moment. So at any rate, what I hope then I've illustrated in three examples is we can turn the kind of structure we've been talking about into mechanism by single particle methods that, and I, by single particle here I meant single mole in the single molecule kinetic study sense, not the use of that phrase in 3D electron microscopy, which means averaging lots of single particles that you assume identical in order to create a 3D structure. And that uh, we can endow the structures we're talking about, in part with the aid of some computational methods, since that's the synergy we're talking about in this meeting, into um, a molecular movie of a mechanism. So with that, I think I've mentioned the people who did most of this work. I failed to mention so far Aliyah Abdul Hakim, who did most of that uh, uh, single um, uh, virion uh, entry work on, on rotavirus uh, prior to the recent uh, light sheet stuff that you saw yesterday in collaboration with Tommy's lab. Thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, let's begin down here. Um, in, in the turf studies you yep. mentioned, uh, can you tell us more about uh, the supported membrane? Ah, yes. <laughs> the composition, what needs to be in it? OK, so um, first, sometimes we supported it on a dextran cushion so we could actually make sure that loss of the content dye wasn't inhibited by the fact that the aqueous layer between a glass-supported bilayer and the bilayer is only about 10 angstroms or whatever it is. Um, and other, but many of the studies for hemifusion, we showed that it didn't matter whether it was directly on glass or on. on. The, the composition of the membrane was chosen to represent a cell membrane, a bit of cholesterol. And, and we haven't um, <laughs> done extensive studies varying that composition. And that's an interesting kind of experiment that we haven't yet done. Related to that, is it feasible to do that kind of experiment with uh, uh, bilayer membranes right across a hole in a partition between uh, low pH uh, side where you introduce the virus and the side where you look for the naked particle that's been delivered? You probably could rig that up. We haven't tried to do that. That would take a little bit of engineering uh, because you couldn't use a dextran cushion then and so on. But yes, I, I, that is, I think, with some cleverness, that could be. There's no reason it can't be done. It's only a question of how you decide to 
arrange the microscopy. You can't do turf right. because you've got a, a much thicker specimen, but you know, maybe with the, the, the that's in turf isn't utterly essential. It's useful for signal noise. So that, that the answer is yes, but we haven't thought about that. Steve, what do you think is the degree of It's a good question. We don't know exactly. My, uh, that is, there are people who've done all kinds of, you know, sort of healthish potential calculations about that kind of thing. But uh, my guess is that it's a few angstroms, and I guess Parsegian probably <coughs> did some calculations about that at one time. That is, we know from his work, this is old work, that that 15 angstroms is about where you sort of hit a wall, and um, what the other side of that barrier is, I bet if we look back at, at, at that work, which is in the 1980s, um, oh, there might be some estimate of the, of the other end of it. Okay, one more question and we have to stop the session. So. Can we try looking at what happens when you uh, implantate the high the that's, that's been done. Judy White did that a long time ago, and that's actually why I drew some things that I drew, but I didn't have time to talk about it. So Judy observed already um, uh, uh, 25, 30 years ago, that early 90s, late 80s, that a GPI anchor left you stuck at hemifusion. She then went on to show, in a very nice paper in about 19... 92, uh, 95, I don't remember, Armstrong is the first author, that if you, and we, she also showed, or others showed, I don't remember who did this, that you can substitute other transmembrane anchors, VSV and so on. All that matters is that there's an anchor in that case. The properties of the anchor, other than it be a helical segment that goes through the membrane, is all that matters. And by truncating the cytoplasmic domain, she showed that what matters is that something sticks out the other end, anything. One arginine is enough. And that if you truncate so that the, the TM can't get across the membrane, then you're back to hemifusion the way you are with the GPI anchor. And that's why I drew what I believe to be, but I didn't talk about it, the catalysis of the final fusion pore opening. Namely, if a fusion pore flickers open and the transmembrane segments can then resolve the barrier that would otherwise prevent the fusion peptides, which is in one membrane, and the transmembrane segments, which are in another, from getting together, then you can't reverse. And we know that fusion pores flicker open and close. So that my guess about that catalysis is that you render it irreversible by finishing off the recovery of threefold symmetry from the final collapse. And that it, you, you would not um, uh, do so if the, um, if, if the transmembrane segment or a GPI anchor didn't go all the way through because you could resolve back to the threefold structure still with a hemifusion stalk since you'd only be in the outer leaflet, so to speak. But that's, I've told you the evidence and I've told you my speculative guess, but when we've got with the West Nile virus a better idea of how to play with that, uh, we'll try to resolve that issue further. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Now we're going to the coffee break. Uh, please put up your posters if you have uh, posters and come back here at 11.30. Hi. I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, 